Praise the Lord. Why don't you stand with us? We're just going to enter into his presence this morning and give him praise. Hallelujah. Turn your ear to heaven and hear the noise inside. The sound of angels are the sound of angel songs and all this for a king. We could join and sing all to Christ the King. How constant, how divine this song of ours will rise. Oh, how constant, how divine, this love of ours will rise, will rise. Oh, praise Him, oh, praise Him, He is holy, He is holy, enter. Your gaze to heaven and raise the joyous noise. The sound of salvation come, the sound of rescued ones, and all this for a king. Angels join to sing, all for Christ the King. And sweet, this love so rescuing. Oh, how infinitely sweet this great love that has redeemed as one. into this room today, Lord Jesus, on this first Sunday of November, Lord, a season that, Lord, as your church, we need to lead in being thankful. And Lord, we might live in a time where people are ungrateful, where people are mad, or where they're angry, or they're afraid. But Lord, we know that regardless of what's going on in this world, you are a faithful God, and you deserve the love and the thanksgiving of your people. So as we come into this room today, Lord, we come to give you glory and praise and honor. Lord, for every family that's tuning in in the living room this morning, Jesus, Lord, for those who are gathered in this place, we want you to be lifted up in this time today. We'll give you the praise and the glory and the honor. We invite you, Jesus, be honored in our service today. We ask it, say with me, church, in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Who's glad to be in church this morning? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Welcome to Destin. If you're watching online, we're glad that you're watching today. We know that COVID cases are up in the world, but uh, we're still coming together to worship. Amen. So let's just put our hands together. Let's praise the Lord and worship together and just rejoice in Jesus.
You're here and I know you are moving. I'm using your heat. Let it 
who died to ransom the slave. And is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? And is he worthy? Is he worthy? Is he
the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze shall stand on Jesus' face so praise the name so Hallelujah, hallelujah, glory to your name, Lord, we praise you, Jesus, we praise you, Jesus. You know, we live in the middle of uncertain times these days. There's a lot of fear in our world, a lot of fear over Elections, there's a lot of fear over disease, there's a lot of fear over economy. But the one thing that is certain is that we have a real Jesus. We have a real Savior, a real God, and He loves us, and He cares about us, and He's going to watch over us and care for us. And if we are in right relationship with Him, we don't have to fear tomorrow. We don't have to fear the things that are going on all around us. Let's just thank the Lord today. Let's just stop and give thanks to Jesus for the certainty for our rock, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. We praise you, Jesus. You take your cups with me this morning. We've passed out the elements. We're on the praise team. You just prepare that bread. If you're at home, you can you want to grab some bread and juice. Doesn't matter if it's grape juice or not. I'm so thankful for all that God has done. And you know, I have to honestly say today that even though we don't know what all is taking place, we don't know what this week will hold. They're saying that there may be riots in our streets and unrest in our country. But you know what? My God went to a cross. He bled and died, he rose from the dead, he's greater than anything that can happen in our world. And this morning, I want to be thankful for a God who not only died for me the first time he came, but one who's coming back for me. Amen? Because reality is, what we're seeing going on is Jesus is getting ready to return. He's getting ready to come back. Those of us who have 
received his sacrifice. Those of us who put our faith in him, those of us who have turned our lives over to him and are serving him and, and loving him, we don't have to fear. Let's take this bread that's in our hand and let's stop and give thanks for it today. Jesus, I thank you for your body. Lord, your world certainly was not certain. Your world certainly was not happy the day that you were arrested and tried and crucified. But Lord, in that suffering, you brought forth hope. And Lord, when your flesh was laid down on that cross and nailed to that tree, Jesus, in that moment, when the stripes were taken upon your back, a sacrifice was being made to redeem all those who by faith would put their hope in you. Lord, you intended to complete us. And what the law could not do by your sacrifice, you intended to make us whole. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your body that was broken for us. And Lord, I pray for those who may be at home who are sick. I know we have several families that are being tested right now for COVID. Lord Jesus, I know of other pastors who are being tested for COVID in their families, Lord. I know others that are going through other sickness and other issues right now, Jesus. Lord, I'm thankful that we can put our confidence and our hope in you today. And Lord, as we partake of this bread together, we remember the sacrifice you made for us. Let's partake of the bread together. Thank you, Jesus. But not just his body that was broken for us, but his blood that was shed. Nothing can make us righteous except for the blood of Jesus. Nothing can give us the hope of eternity with him except for his blood that was shed for us. Blood that was powerful a way to wash away every mistake we've ever made, every sin we've ever committed, every wrong we've ever done. It's the blood of Jesus. It's powerful to heal, it's powerful to save, it's powerful to restore. It's powerful to deliver us from addictions and bondages. It's powerful enough. Do we believe that when we hold this cup in our hand, this communion cup of juice, that it represents the blood, the life-giving blood of the Son of God, whose blood was sinless and spotless and pure, the perfect sacrifice, the blood that will one day allow us to be either raptured out of this world or resurrected from the dead. It's his blood. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for this cup. And Lord, yesterday, across our land, people celebrated darkness. They celebrated, celebrated evil. They celebrated death. But today, Lord, I hold the cup in my hand, and I'm celebrating life. I'm celebrating resurrection. I'm celebrating the light that comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ, the hope that you bring into the world. Jesus, I am thankful. We are thankful today that you shed your blood, that the wages of our sin was death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you this morning for that hope. Let's partake of that cup together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let's just praise him today. Of the Lord our God, oh, praise his name forevermore, for endless days we will sing. Again, oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name 
Church, I'm going to ask if you would just reach up your hands towards heaven this morning. And I want you to agree with me this morning for our land. We need to pray for our nation today. We need to pray for this land that we live in today. We need to ask God to intervene for peace in this land. Can we do that today? Father, we come before you this morning. And Lord Jesus, we pray, Lord, That God, you see a very critical time in the history of our nation. Lord, a land that's been filled with freedom, a land that has been filled with Christian values, a land that's been filled with hope, and that sent that hope around the world. But God, as we live in these days, that we can see the coming of your Son so close. We see great unrest and great division. And Lord, you've not called your church to take sides, but you've called our church to lift up Jesus. And God, we want to lift you up and we want to pray for your peace and reconciliation in this land. God, we want to come before you and ask God that where there are threats of rioting, that there are threats of unrest, where there are threats of disruption, Lord, to be made this week, that God, we want to pray that, Lord, whatever darkness is calling upon, that, Lord, the light of the gospel would dispel. Lord, we want to ask for the angels on high, Lord God, to go forth in spiritual might and power, and, Lord, bring peace and protection. We want to ask that you would release the heavenly hosts over our nation. And, Jesus, we have need of you. Lord, People don't need a president right now. They need a king. They need King Jesus. They need the King of kings and the Lord of lords. They need to surrender and turn their hearts over the one that gives true peace and can give true hope, over the one that didn't just come once but is coming again and is going to reign for eternity, a a peaceful reign, a godly reign, a reign that is not divided. I pray, God, that in this season, that you would open the eyes of the blind to see truth. You are that truth. And Lord, we call. We call upon your name and we call upon your hand to move throughout our land this week, Lord Jesus. Because we need you. Father, I also want to pray. Lord, last night, you allowed us to give out some 700, 800 bags with books of hope and tracts that explain the plan of salvation. And God, I pray that that literature that's sitting on people's tables or couches or in kids' bedrooms, I pray, Lord, that your spirit would draw them. Lord, even as you drew people to read banners last night and to see pictures, Lord God, of, of of the Word of God put out in a picture format, that, God, you would draw them to those truths. And I pray that, God, even though they might not understand, that your Holy Spirit would draw people and convict them of sin and draw them to relationship with you, that you would put a hunger and a thirst into the hearts of people for the things of God. And Lord, that the word that was scattered yesterday, that it would not return void. Lord, may it not return void. Jesus, we ask this In your name, the precious holy name of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless you as you're seated. Let's see what's going on this week at Destiny. Happy November to you, Destiny Church. It's awesome to be with you guys on this Fall Back Sunday. I want to quickly remind you all about giving. When you give your tithe, there are a couple of options for you. You can give on our website, yourdestinychurch.org. If you're here in the sanctuary, the greeters will be right outside in the lobby after service to collect offerings as well. 
Finally, you can mail your tithe and offering to P.O. Box 144, Fort Lepton, Colorado, 80621. I just want to thank everyone who helped with our Trunk or Tree outreach. Thanks to everyone who assembled candy bags, did set up, tear down, and those of you that were there to participate. Because of you guys, we were able to share the gospel with so many people. Coming up this week, we have our first Wednesday, Prayer and Praise. This is such an important part of who we are as a church, and I encourage you to come out and join in. Coming up on November 15th, we are so excited to be doing water baptism. If you're interested in being baptized, please indicate it on the Connect card on the back of your bulletin. Pastor Rob will be teaching a baptism class on that Tuesday, November 10th at 6 p.m. here at the church. Before I go, I want to remind you guys about our etiquette here on Sunday mornings. We want to encourage you during the preaching portion, reduce going in and out of the sanctuary to avoid distracting others from the word. Also, make sure you keep those social distancing guidelines. This is what enables us to keep gathering as we are. I want to thank all you parents for being here in service with us. As a mom of small children, I know how hard it is to get everyone ready and out the door for church. I want to remind you of the awesome resources we have here at Destiny. First and foremost, we have an awesome kids ministry team. For your youngest kids, we have a staffed nursery downstairs. For your school age kids, there's an excellent class just for them as well. I know that sometimes our littles may not want to go to class, and in that event, the service is also playing in the lobby and in the nursing mother's room downstairs. If your children are getting fussy, we encourage you to take advantage of these resources. Again, thank you guys so much for being here. We are so grateful to be a multi-generational congregation, and we love our young family. Thanks again for worshiping. Amen. You alive today? Y'all eat too much sugar last night, and you're kind of like spacing this morning. Y'all good? Amen. If you're at home, put the Reese's candy down. All right. I didn't eat one piece of chocolate yesterday. I'm like, wow. I wasn't even trying to not eat one piece of chocolate. I just did it because all the candy was bagged that we handed out, and there was none just hanging around. We got home, like, we have no candy in this house. I'm like, that's good. Kyle. You gotta smile bigger because I can't see through your masks. There we go. Amen. Well, it is November 1st, and I want to, as your pastor, encourage you not only to come out for prayer this Wednesday night, but I also want to encourage you to stop and make this month a month of Thanksgiving. You know, people for two months start getting ready to celebrate Halloween. And then the other day I was trying to go buy some pumpkin things for the outreach. And they were all gone because Christmas was out. And I'm like, hold it. There's another day in between there. And I sometimes wonder if 2020 maybe went this way because maybe we've become so ungrateful as a people. Because we go right from the devil to, to, to Santa Claus. And, and I think that we need to stop and remember there's a season of Thanksgiving. Every day should be a day of Thanksgiving for a Christian. But man, let's make this year your Thanksgiving. It's like, Pastor, but I lost my job. Pastor, I might get COVID. Pastor, the world's going crazy. Pastor, politics, I think my president didn't win or my, my presidential candidate didn't win. I don't know, I, I, I'm not happy. There's always something to give thanks for, amen? There's always something. Are you safe? That's the greatest reason to give thanks. Who slept in the bed last night? Who slept with a roof over your head last night? How many have clothes on your body today? Did you eat breakfast? If you didn't, there's donuts out there. You see, there's, we have food and clothing and shelter. None of you in this room have COVID. Amen? Some of you have had it, and you're still here. Amen? But there's so much to be thankful for. Let's remember to be a thankful people. Amen? Praise God. I do want to again, I know it was in the announcements, but I want to again just say thank you to our team that came out and so if we had a great team, there's about 12 people out yesterday who were, who were on the thing. Give them a big hand again. Can we just do that? Hopefully we'll get a little recap of, of last night. You can also go on my Facebook page and see a little video and some things of what we did. But man, we had a great time. It was so good to see people in our community. We got to see some people from our church who we haven't seen since COVID as well. And it was so good to be able to um, connect in with people in our community and to hand out God's word. Man, they were driving up so we could hand them the word of God. We didn't have to do anything. It was the easiest way to hand someone a piece of the Word of God on the face of the earth. It was awesome. Amen. Let's this morning, let's turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Revelation chapter 3. And we are on our final church in our series on the seven churches of Revelation. 
This morning we're going to come to probably what is seen as many people as the most well-known church in this series, the Church of Laodicea. We know it more as the lukewarm church. Everybody has this church. It has probably been preached upon more about the church at Laodicea than any of the other seven churches because, of course, everybody wants to know when churches get, get apathetic, when churches get slowed down, when churches stop doing what God's called us to do, people want to tell them about not being lukewarm. And we all kind of heard that phrase that Jesus said, you're neither hot nor cold, but you are lukewarm and I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. Now, I have a really nasty illustration this morning. Vomit is nasty. I have a dog, and I don't know what she ate this week, but man, she took to projectile vomiting all over our house the other day. It was horrendous. Kimberly started crying out and screaming, help, help. And I had to go, and I'm like going, literally, I mean, I won't go any more detail because you don't need to hear the details, but it was not good. Thankfully, stuff came out of the carpets, they came out of things, it was just not good. And man, what a visual illustration I have in my mind this morning of God saying, I will vomit you out of my mouth. But you know what, that's not what I want us to mostly focus on this morning. Because even though the Laodicean church, remember how we said some churches had no, no complaints and some churches had no praise? The Laodicean church had no praise. They only had a complaint against them. However, probably the most hopeful message that Jesus gives to any of the churches is given to this lukewarm church. He gives them great hope. He presents who he is. He presents what he can do and what he can do for them. And, what he's, and then he calls them to come because his desire is for them to not remain lukewarm. His desire is for them to become a fervent, either hot or cold. And when he says hot or cold, he's not talking about the cold of being chilled to the things of God. He's talking about being useful in the kingdom. He wants them to be a useful, gainful, purpose-driven church that's doing the things of the kingdom that he sees. And this is really probably the, one of the most hopeful messages that we see. So yes, he says, if you stay lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. And if I could get you to think of a 60-pound golden doodle vomiting all over my house, you can get a really nasty visualization of that. But really what I want you to see is what God wants to do for us, amen? What God wants to do in our lives. He gives these warnings to the church, to each one of them, with the ending that says, May, let, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. He wants us to hear this. So often we come into church, church I, I gotta tell you, as a pastor, there comes points of frustration in my life. I'm going to share one of them with you, okay? That people can hear the word of God week after week after week and not change their lives. We have the power of Jesus Christ. We have the blood of Jesus. We have the truth of the word. We have, we have time that we can come and, and, and commune with him in prayer and praise. And yet we can come and sit in a church and we can go out and we can drink and we can party and we can, we can, we can fill our minds with garbage. We can go through sexual perversion and sexual lust. We can do all kinds of different things and then come back to church again the next Sunday and not allow God to change our lives. He didn't save you for you to stay that way. That is not just a sinful church that we've heard about over the last six weeks. but That's also an apathetic church that's hearing the word and not doing anything with it. Well, I told you I wanted to give you the hope, not the heart, right? So let's give you the hope. Let's talk about Laodicea. Here's a community. It's over 300 years old. It was started by Antiochus, a, a Greek empire, and it was named after his wife, Laodice. It was along the major trade routes, and because of its location, kind of in a, in a gorge, kind of down in a, in a canyon, it was a very well-traveled road that all the trade routes had to go through, only through those areas, to get to other places. Many, like the other ch churches in other cities, very strategically planted. However, it was very subject to a lot, of, a lot of military force against it until the Roman Empire came in and protected it. And when it did that, this community surged in prosperity, the military might of the Roman Empire caused it to surge in great prosperity. Now you would think that a community that surged in great prosperity would be one that would want to be thankful to God. 
Of course, their deities were not godly ones, but you would think that the church in a community like that would be a church that was so appreciative of all that God's done for them. Kind of like you think that the American church in a land of such great prosperity and such, such great power and such great might that we would be a people that would be so tuned into God because we were so thankful and appreciative to God. But that wasn't the case with this church. Now, there were three things that the city of Laodicea was known for. Three different things. One was their wealth. They were a banking center, but they were powerfully wealthy. If you, if you might think that, that, that other cities had wealth, these would be like the Beverly Hills of those cities. They were, they were uber wealthy. They had great money that ran through their community and ran in the realms. These were not suffering people by any way, shape, or form. And their wealth, however, would be their downfall. That would be their issue. They were also known for the clothing trade. And we know a lot of them were known for clothing trade, but they had a very specific kind of cloth. You see, they had these black sheep that had this purpley, violet, glossy silk coats. And they were known for this beautiful black textiles that they would put out and that they would produce. And so they were known for being the people that were well-dressed and for exporting very great garments out to other places. The third thing they were well-known for in their day, and these are, all gonna, these are all important because Jesus actually addresses them over these issues. The third thing that they were also known for in that day was that they had a great medical university there. And this medical university had discovered cures for eye, for eye problems and ear problems. They had a salve that they made that when people were, were, getting, were getting eye wounds and eye problems, that the salve had a great healing power to help restore blindness and to help restore other injuries to the eye. And it was exported. It was known all across the land, this eye salve. And that was made in this place. So they had medical, clothing, and banking. They were a very wealthy, wealthy community. They also had one other thing they were known for. This one reminds me of 13 years of my life. Because of where they were located, there was no good water source. And the water that they had to tap into, the springs that they had to tap into, were not underneath their ground, were not in their land, but they were at least six miles away. And they had to be brought into the city through aqueducts. And by the time they got to the city, it was pretty gross spring water that had just become totally tepid. There was no heat, there was no water to it, but it was lukewarm, and they considered it to be nasty. It reminds me of living in Phoenix for 13 years. Because if you want to know what the nastiest water in our nation tastes like, just go to Phoenix, Arizona. It's horrible. You could even have an ice and water maker refrigerator, and when you go to use that thing, it still comes out lukewarm because it gets so hot running through the, through the city. The water was not known for being a good source. Hot springs people love. Hot springs are desired. There's minerals. There's health benefits. You know, you get into a hot spring. Five hours on pavement yesterday when we were doing that outreach, I hurt last night. Man, this morning I got up really early. I got up on regular time, an hour ahead of time. I got up on regular time at 6.30, which was actually 5.30 this morning, and I just moseyed out to my hot tub and just because the hot water as soon as I got into that thing all the aches and pains I had yesterday just kind of began to melt away hot water has some great benefits it's also if you like drinking tea or other things it's what's used to infuse other things so you can get flavor out of it and cold water is thirst quenching it's refreshing it revitalizes our inner man when we're overheated it helps cool us down but their water was known to be tepid so let's look at Jesus address to them Revelation 3, verses 14 to 22. Speaking of water, I have some here, and it has ice on it because I don't like my water tepid. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful, and true witness. The beginning of God's new creation. I know all the things you do, that you are neither hot nor cold, and I wish that you were one or the other. But since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. Don't realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, about that. Remember this church? Banking center? Clothing center? Medical healing center for the eyes? And he says, you are miserable, poor, blind, and wretched. 
So I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments, the opposite of black garments, for me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness. An ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he There are three things I want to talk about this morning. The first is that wealth does not replace our need for truth. You know, a wealthy community, a wealthy nation, a wealthy society often is willing to forego truth, forego their need for God, and forego their need for God's truth so they can continue to enjoy what they have because they have become so self sufficient. What does that sound like? Sounds like our country. One of the wealthiest nations in the world, if not the wealthiest nation in the world. Powerful. Our poor live better than other countries rich. We have great resource. We're known for greatness. We're known for so many things. We produce so many products and we're known for so much great things. This community was wealthy, but they were not grabbing hold of the truth of who Jesus Christ really was. And you know, I hear people around, they go around and they claim, they, they call themselves by the name Christian. They call themselves by the name of Jesus Christ. They, they say, oh, I'm a Christian, but they really have no relationship with Jesus Christ. He's just kind of added in there with everything else. Because in their lives, they don't necessarily see their need to be dependent or to be surrendered to Jesus. That's what wealth does to us. It gives us a sense that I don't need to surrender myself to God because I have what I need. I can provide. I work. I have a job. I can, give my, I can buy myself the food that I need. I have a roof over my head. I'm not really struggling. I can do my own thing. And because of this, they were very tepid. They were very Apathetic. You know, it's amazing how people will turn to Jesus when they're in times of crisis. You turn the heat up on their lives and they run to Jesus. Or you make everything cool and smooth and easygoing. People, we are so easily running to God only because of need. But when we don't have need, we're so easy to just let go of Him, to become dispassionate, to not be focused on who He is. Or what he wants to do in our lives. So Jesus comes and he approaches them. And you need to look at how he approaches them. He approaches them with who he is. He says, I am the amen. I am the amen. What does that word amen mean? We somewhat know it to mean let it be, but it means let it be truth. Let the truth be known. Let the truth be proclaimed. So when he says, I am the amen, he is saying, I am that I am. He's saying, amen, I, let it be that I am truth. When they would say amen after prayer, it would be, it'd be like, let this be truth. Let this truth be known. And he's reminding them that even though you have greatness, even though you have wealth, you've indulged in this world, you indulge in the entertainment and the pleasures and all the things of it, but you're not indulging in who I am and I'm truth. You don't think you have need of me, but I am the truth. He then goes on to say, I am the faithful and true witness. Jesus only can bear witness to the truth. He is the word. And I love the fact that he says, I'm not just the word, but I am faithful. I will always be true, and I will always be faithful to what is right and real. You know, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of living in a world of, rel of relative truth. You know the difference between relative and absolute truth? Relative truth is your truth is to you. Uh, you can have your truth, I have my truth, and, and don't mess with my truth, and I won't mess with your truth. Of course, right now, everybody wants their truth to become your truth. 
The reality is, we have given up on the absolute of God's word. We've given up on the faithful and true witness who is truth so we can create our own truth. But when we create our own truth, all we do is create problems. Look at America. Look at the lies. Look at the deceptions. Look at all the problems in our nation because everybody's just speaking their own truth. And there's no absolute truth. We have to come back to the word of God and, and base our lives on the word of God because that is what truth is. Jesus says, I am the faithful and true witness. But you know, when we want to be self-sufficient, we'll go to relative truth instead of absolute truth. And he says, I am the beginning or ruler of creation. What he's doing there is he's establishing his authority that he is truth. In other words, I made this world. So the truth is, my truth is the absolute truth. If someone else made our world, they can call what they want to be truth, truth. But the reality is, whoever the creator is, he sets the ground rules. He sets the truth for the world today. And we know that in the person of Jesus Christ, we find real truth. And he has the authority over it as the beginning and the ruler of creation. These words, these names about Jesus are speaking forth to the church in Laodicea as well as to us today that you can be wealthy and you can think yourself sufficient, but if you don't have my truth, you don't have anything. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all of God's promises have been filled in Christ with the resounding yes, and through Christ our amen, which means yes, extends to God for his glory. In Romans eleven thirty six 36, it says, For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. <coughs> All glory to him forever. Amen. You see, he is that faithful witness. He is that faithful testimony. He is that truth. And he is faithful. The next thing I want to talk about this morning is worldly gain has little usefulness. Do you realize that? We spend most of our life pursuing worldly gain. Don't we? So I'm going to educate myself. I'm going to prepare myself so I can make money, so I can have things. I'm going to go out and I'm going to work 40 to 60 hours a week so I can make money, so I can have things. I'm going to, I'm going to make money so I can entertain myself, so I can have things. It doesn't matter what God needs. It matters what I want. But worldly gain is little usefulness. All the wealth of these people... It left them useless. Interestingly enough, we don't always take a look at this, but the word for lukewarm, the only place it's ever used in the Bible, the Greek word for lukewarm actually means without purpose or useless. We think of it as just like tepid, but it's really speaking of not having purpose, being useless. And we can allow our wealth and our self-sufficiency and our being are, are, are having our needs because we don't, I don't need God, I can do this on my own. To make us think, I don't need God and I don't need his truth, I'll do it on my own and I'm really not worth anything. You see, we become, we become without value, we become useless because our intrinsic value is only when it's found in Jesus Christ. We become people without purpose when our purpose is only based on what we can give ourselves in this world and our purpose isn't based in the person of Jesus Christ. In Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 8, and William, I'm only going to do verse 8. It says, yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ. If we were to go on to that verse and become one with him. Paul said, for me to become one with Christ and gain Christ... That's the only thing that has true value. And the problem, the reason why this church was so useless or lukewarm is because they didn't need him. They didn't think they needed him. But the reality is they needed him more than they could have ever imagined. They needed Jesus more than they could have ever thought that they needed him. But they had become like that, like that lukewarm water that was useless. It was not cold to refresh. It was not cold to keep things preserved. It was not cold to be thirst quenching, and it was not hot to cleanse or to soothe or, or to cook with. It was just useless. God doesn't want us to be in his kingdom and be useless. 
hear that? You're living in your own self-sufficiency. You become useless. And he looks at him and says, you're not rich. You're poor. Like, you're not clothed well. You're naked. You're not insightful. You're blind. Isn't that like how we like to think of ourselves? I got it all together. I got what I need. I have wisdom and insight. Look at how our society today, how people, they call themselves Christian, and yet they have no spiritual righteousness. They have no spiritual wealth. They have no spiritual gain. Because that which is eternal is greater than that which is temporal. The last thing I want to talk about is that in this, he calls them to find true purpose in the relationship with Christ. And you see, it might seem kind of harsh up to now because he's telling them, you know, you're, you're naked, you're poor, and you're blind. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Do you all want to hear that? I mean, how many, how, many, how, many want, how many want your spouse to come up to you and say, ah, you're naked, poor, and blind, I'm going to out of my mouth. Get out. None of us wants to hear that. But yet that's what Jesus said. But then he says something else. He says, come to me. He doesn't kick them out. He doesn't ignore them. He doesn't leave them out there. But he calls them to the most important relationship we can ever have in our lives. You know, there's something that's very true. And young people, I want you to hear me right now. There's something that's very important in your life. Until you come to a right relationship with God, you're never going to have a right relationship with another human being. Some of us as adults need to learn that. Until we are in right relationship with God, we're never going to be able to have right relationship with another human being. Because it's that relationship with God that we can build upon, that we can make right relationships with others. God is more concerned with us being right with him than being right with others. And Jesus in this moment calls them back to relationship. Yes, he says, if you stay lukewarm, I, can't, I don't want to have that taste in my mouth. But he says, come back. The beauty of this chapter is in verse 20, where he says, look, I stand at the door and I knock. I knock. Open up. Some of you, God is doing just what I did. He's like banging down the door. Come in. Let me in. He doesn't want to be on the outside of your life. He wants to be in the middle of your life. He doesn't want you to be dependent on yourself. He wants you to be dependent upon him. And he's saying, if you will open up your life to me, you've never even experienced what I have for you. I got to tell you, church, there are a lot of people who are in the church of Jesus Christ today, and they sit in pews week after week after week after week after week, and year after year and decade after decade, and they still don't know what it is to be dependent on Jesus Christ, to live in real relationship with him, to have him transform their being. And if you're in that place, you got to ask yourself, have I really surrendered everything to Jesus? If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. He says, I want to be in that place of covenant relationship with you. He didn't say, Lady Decia, you guys stink. You guys rot. I'm just, get out of my sight. No, he says, Let me back in to know him personally. And then he says a few things. Come and buy gold refined in the fire. You know, fool's gold, if you refine fool's gold, if you put fool's gold to the fire, it melts away. But real gold, when tested by fire, all the garbage burns to the top and you can skim it off so it comes forth as pure and shining. He says, come and buy gold for me, refine the fire. You might think you have all this wealth. You might think that you have all this money, but you're really poor because you're spiritually just impoverished. But if you would come and buy gold refined in the fire, in my fire, I'm going to make something pure and beautiful out of your life. We're told in 1 Peter 1.7, it says, these trials, 
These trials, you know, sometimes the church, we don't like going through what we're going through in America today. We don't like the stress. We don't like the anxiety. We don't like the problems. We don't like the COVID rules. We don't like the loss of jobs. We don't like all the fear that's put upon us. But you know what? We're told when these trials will show that your faith is genuine. Let me tell you, this season in 2020, it has given clear vision. It has shown whose faith is really genuine and whose is weak. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. Oh, see, God is more concerned about your faith than your physical wealth. You know that, don't you? Prosperity doctrine doesn't work. Yes, when we serve Jesus, there are blessings in serving God. He will meet our needs. But prosperity doctrine does not work because God cares more about our souls than he does about our bank accounts. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. In other words, you might go through these trials, you might go through these circumstances, but I am refining you so that way when the day that Jesus returns for us, we are going to be revealed to the whole world as his. He takes us through those purifying processes in our lives. You can jump out of the fire. You can jump out of the fire, and that's what a lot of people do. Fool's gold. Jump out of the fire and go and try and feed yourself the things of this world again. You know, it's like, instead of letting Jesus meet your need, let the bottle meet your need. Yeah, and let's see where that leaves you when you let the alcohol meet your need. Because what it's going to do, it's going to leave you high and dry. It's probably going to leave you in a worse state than, than, than what you were in before. There's something that I'll tell you, man. When I, when I worked for a year in a state prison, no one was in there. Not one person who was in my class, and I had, I had around 100 different students at the time between my multiple classes, and not one of them was in there that had not committed their crimes without being intoxicated or high. Every single one. If you think that that's going to lead you to happiness, you're sorely wrong. If you think that you're going to get rid of your stress and your troubles through, through, through sexual immorality, that's going to leave you wrong too. You know, something I, we, Kimberly and I like, we like to watch like Dateline, all these like, these like the real life kind of like cases and what stuff. You know, every single thing comes back to, to sex and booze and greed. Sex, booze, and greed. And the destruction of lives and families and everything else because of sex, booze, and greed. That shouldn't be the way it is in God's house. Let the trials refine you. Let, him, let trials turn you to draw closer to God. Let them turn you into his word. Let them turn you into prayer, into pursuit of him, and be refined in my fire. He says, I want to be your friend. If you would just come to me instead of to that other stuff, you'll find that I can restore your life rather than tear it down. We find that that's when he works in our lives. That's when our true value comes forth. And he then talks about clothing us, clothing our nakedness with his white robes. Kind of an interesting contrast because they were makers of black woolen textiles. Beautiful black woolen textiles. Hey, I like a good black shirt or black sweater. Great, sharp, it's cool. But he was talking about something different. He was talking about the fact that you're spiritually naked because of the dirt and the filth in your life. He says, but if you would come to me, I'm going to clothe you in white robes of righteousness. Your lives are unrighteous because you're apathetic to me because you're doing your own thing, but I want to put white robes on you. And you, right now, you are spiritually naked. It takes me back to the Garden of Eden. You know, if we go back to the Garden of Eden, the 12 of you who helped out the outreach, remember the Garden of Eden? <laughs> if you were there yesterday, we had a big steak and we had a naked Adam and Eve with nicely placed ferns around them and stuff and and James in a tiger suit and uh, hanging, hanging out with an animal in the garden and stuff last night. In the Garden of Eden, everything was perfect. It was all perfect. Adam and Eve could be naked and it didn't bother them. But the moment that they disobeyed God and they ate of the fruit of that tree, in that moment, the wage of their sin was death. And the wage of that sin also revealed their minds to be naked. They realized before they never knew that they were naked, but now their minds were opened so they recognized their nakedness. They were no longer innocent, but they were shamed. And in that the nakedness or the unveiling of their minds, 
They had to try and clothe themselves or cover themselves with leaves because they felt that nakedness. And what did God do? God said, kill an animal, an innocent life, to cover your nakedness. Leather is biblical. It is. Animals were killed to cover the nakedness of people because of their sin. Because their minds had become unveiled from their sinful choice and disobedience. And then Jesus said, that blood that was shed was the offering that was paid for the sin that they had committed. And then Jesus became that ultimate sacrifice that we celebrated this morning. His blood shed so that we could be restored. And because of his blood, we have a promise of putting on those white robes of righteousness. Jesus is saying, stop being apathetic in your life. Stop being apathetic in the things that you do. Stop being lukewarm and start realizing that I can clothe your nakedness. Maybe not with these and not with these black fancy linens that you make or this black fancy wool stuff that you make, but I will clothe your nakedness with my righteousness. And then he talks about restoring sight to the blind. You know, perhaps the greatest of things that the city was known for was that eye salve. Nobody else made it. Nobody else produced it. The local university had the handle on it. You see, today, there are people who think they have the wisdom of this world. They think they have the thoughts of this world. They think that they know what's right. People think they're so insightful because of all that they have. Why is it that people who have wealth think that they have the knowledge to tell everybody else what is? Why is that? You know, I'm sorry, but just because you can act on a television or in a movie and you got wealthy because of that doesn't mean that I think you're smart means I think you can lie well by acting. The same with half the politicians out there. Maybe 90%, I don't know, maybe all the politicians out there. But why is it that even in universities and professors, they think we have all the wisdom? <laughs> we have all the wisdom. When God is saying, no, you might think you have this world's wisdom, but you're really blind. 1 Corinthians 3.19 says, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. As, a, as the scripture is saying, realize this, the more a world comes away from God, the more what they tell you is stupid. It's foolishness. He traps the wise in the snare of their own cleverness. 1 Corinthians 1.20 says, So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? Hmm. God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. 1 Corinthians 2, 6, it says, Yet when I am among mature believers, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world or to the rulers of this world who are soon forgotten. You see, we might think that there's great wisdom in this world, but really without Christ, we know no real wisdom. And Jesus is saying, I'm the faithful and the true witness. I am the amen. I am where all truth begins. I am the creator of all. He said, if you come to me, not only can you buy gold refined in the, in the fires, not only can you find white robes of righteousness to clothe your nakedness, but I will release your blindness so you can spiritually see truth. There are so many people, even in the church today, that I think of in a church, but they're still living with blindness over their eyes because they have not allowed the insightfulness of the wisdom of God's word into their lives. You know, one of the ways that you have to do that is you have to read the thing. You have to open up your Bibles and read them to allow its light into your soul. And then he makes this promise, and I'll say this in closing because I'm getting a little bit later. He says, you will sit on my throne with me. You will sit on my throne. For those, he said, who are victorious, for those who come back to that relationship, for those of you who, who open up the door of your life again and when I'm knocking, I am going to come in and then we're going to fellowship together. He says, and those of you who are victorious, you will sit on my throne with me. You'll sit on my throne with me. Not only will I give you that gold, not only will I clothe you, not only will I release your blindness, but you will reign with me. Because you see, when Jesus comes back, you can't reign with him if you can't see now. You can't reign with him if you're not clothed in his robes of righteousness. You can't reign with him if you haven't been refined. He's coming back for a church that's ready. 
And you know what? For years, people have been saying, we got time, we got time, we got time. Look at our world today. We don't got no time. We don't have any time. Things are all in place right now for Jesus to return. We're just going through the early birth pains. We're going through early contractions right now to what's about to come upon this world. This is the time to be ready. So do we want to be spit out of his mouth or do we want to answer his call and let him do more in our lives than he has ever done? Bow your heads with me. Just close your eyes. And let's just take a moment this morning. Ask ourselves, where am I with Jesus? You see, these seven churches all speak to us of preparing our hearts our lives for when he comes back. Now is the time, church. Now is the time to look within. Are you lukewarm? Have you been useless? Not wealthy spiritually, not clothed spiritually, not insightful spiritually. He's calling out today. He's knocking on the door of our hearts. He's saying, open. Open the door. Open the door. Come by gold refined in the fire. Let me clothe you with white robes. Let me give you sight where there's been blindness. You've been doing it your way so long, you felt so self-sufficient. Where has that left you? Where has that dropped you off at? Where are you because you thought you could do it yourself rather than surrendering to me? He's looking for us. Surrender. Jesus. Whether you're at home right now watching online, whether you're watching this as a broadcast later on in this week, or if you're here in this room right now, Jesus is knocking on the door. He's knocking. Are you going to let him in? Are you going to let him in? Are you going to say, I don't want to be apathetic. I don't want to be useless. I don't want to be lukewarm. He's calling you to relationship. He's calling you back to that place. He's calling you. to buy gold refined in the fire. Will you surrender right now? Will you surrender right now in this moment? If you need to make something right with Jesus, lift up your hand to the Lord right now. You're not raising it for me this morning. You're just lifting it up to the Lord saying, God, I gotta get some things right with you today. I recognize I've been a little self-sufficient this morning. Just put your hand in the air and say, God, I got to make it right. I got to get some things going in the right direction here. Because you see, now is the opportunity that God wants to work. Now's the time.
This morning, we just worship the Lord this morning. come before you today, Jesus. Recognizing we need you. Lord, may we never be so self-sufficient that we become useless. Father, I pray for those who have reached out to you from their hearts today, whether in this room or in their home or watching later on, that Lord, you would draw us to buy gold refined in the fire to allow you to clothe us with white robes of righteousness and to give us sight where we've had blindness. Lord, may we come back in relationship with you above all other relationships, Jesus, so you may perfect your way in our lives. We surrender before you today, Lord. We surrender before you today, Lord Jesus. And we ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Now bless your people as we go from this place today. Give us a blessed week this week, Lord God. 
And Lord, as we come out to pray on Wednesday, Lord, meet us in this place till we come again next Sunday. We ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you as you go.